Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, uh, webinar, uh, EC special webinar. Uh, today, we'll hear about non Hermitian physics, especially non Hermitian optics and uh, topological photonics. Uh, and we have uh, today the speaker, Professor Mercedes <coughs> Ajavikan. Uh, she's an associate professor and IBM uh, early career chair at uh, Electrical Engineering Department at the University of uh, Southern California. She received her PhD in electrical engineering from University of Minnesota, and uh, then later joined University of California, San Diego as a postdoctoral researcher, uh, where she worked on the development of nano lasers, plasmonic devices, and silicon photonic components. And uh, in 2012, she started as an assistant professor in Creole College of Optics and Photonics at University of Central Florida. And uh, then recently, last year, uh, August 2019, she moved to University of uh, Southern California. She has won many awards for her uh, pioneering work in the field of non Hermitian photonics. And uh, just to mention a few NSF Kerley Early Career Award, uh, ONR Young Investigator Award, DARPA Young Faculty Award, and uh, DARPA Director's Fellowship. Uh, welcome, Mercedes, and the stage is yours. Thank you and good afternoon and thanks Guru for the introduction. Um, my name is Mercedes Khajavi Khan and I'm from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Southern California. <clears throat> the title of my talk is uh, Non-Hermitian Anthropological Photonics, Optics at an Exceptional Point. And I have to warn you, I, I think I was over ambitious. I, when I started to put the slides together, <clears throat> It's mostly about non-hermitian and very little about topological, but it's about the most recent results that we have on topological photonics. <clears throat> so today I'm presenting some of the work that uh, we did over the last few years at Creole, where I was a faculty from 2012 to 2019, and since then at USC. These works, of course, have been done in collaboration with um, many people. Um, um, you know, uh, several other faculties, as you can see their names here. And of course, together with our students and postdocs, uh, some of them are still in our group, some of them uh, already left to get uh, jobs. Um, as you will see in my talk, together with the, all these people, and thanks to optics community in general, in, in large, we generated new sets of engineering conceptual tools um, from some pure mathematical objects that not only can be used by those in the field of optics and photonics, but also to a great extent can be applied to other fields from quantum to electronics and acoustics. And quite frankly, I get surprised some of the new results I said, they're so good. <clears throat> and hopefully in the years to come, we will see the widespread use of these concepts and these tools by engineers and scientists uh, in various disciplines. So I'm going to start with this uh, cartoon that has been posted in Nature Physics back in 2015, 15 for their anniversary, 10-year uh, anniversary. The cartoon intends to make fun of uh, some of the most cited articles that appeared in Nature Physics at that, at that decade. Incidentally, two of the, those topics, namely paradigm symmetry and topological, photon, topological uh, insulators, actually uh, are the subject of the current talk. Um, so I will start my talk by PD symmetry in optics and will continue to topological photonics. Let me first put a layout, uh, lay out the background and uh, as why non-hermeticity is an interesting property and how it leads to some counterintuitive behaviors and how we can use it. As we know, the evolution of a system <clears throat> in general is governed by a Hamiltonian. For example, if you are basically working with circuit theory, the Hamiltonian equation, expresses the time evolution of vol voltages and currents, and it basically relates that time evolution to the voltage and current that you have in the system. So it's a very powerful um, approach to understand some of the um, properties of a system without really dealing with all the initial conditions and so on. In most systems that we encountered in optics and many other physical disciplines, as of uh, this Hamiltonian is designed or you know, intended to actually be as close as possible to a Hermitian Hamiltonian. <clears throat> Hermitian systems have many interesting properties 
including the fact that their eigenvalues are all real and their eigenvectors form an orthonormal set. So this, for example, allows to uniquely map an input beam into a various modes of a multi-mode fiber because a multi-mode fiber is designed to have as little loss as possible. So it would be a good representation of a permission system. To give you a more clear picture of our system, uh, uh, if, if our system has two, um, you know, two degrees of freedom. So if, if basically we are dealing with a system that has two degrees of freedoms, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hermitian system will be like this. So we have two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors like, because it's a two dimensional system or it's two degrees of freedom system with two degrees of freedom. But also it happens that in this case, um, lambda one and lambda two are both real and V1 and V2 are orthogonal to each other, as you can see here. Um, a situation of interest happens when you start to change the parameter of the system. And eventually you get to a point where lambda one and lambda two become equal to each other. Uh, we call this point a degeneracy point, and particularly we call this point in the parameter space that you're changing the parameter to get to this point, a diabolic point. Nevertheless, even when you get to a degeneracy in a Hermitian system, you're, even though lambda one and lambda two or the eigenvalues are becoming the same, the eigenvectors remain orthogonal to each other. Now let's take a look at what happens in a non-Hermitian system, which is basically mathematically means that the Hamiltonian must no longer be self-adjoint. In this case, um, in general, um, you know, we expect that the eigenvalues to be complex and the eigenvectors basically no longer need to be orthogonal to each other. So in general, we expect something, some, some, some representation of a system would be like this. And you could see that the two eigenvectors are no longer uh, orthogonal to each other. Now, in this type of system, if we start to change the parameter, we might be able to get to a point where the two eigenvalues become equal to each other, but not only that, but also the two eigenvectors become collinear. And this is why this, this very special type of degeneracy that is unique to non-Hermitian system is known as a non-Hermitian degeneracy. And this, this corresponding point in the parameter space is known as an exceptional point. And this is, a, in fact, a point that was known, that this property was known to mathematicians for a long time. And they were aware of these unusual properties that, that happens at this point, and that explains the naming of exception. Now, even though it's a very interesting concept, and it, as we'll see in this talk, it has a lot of uh, ramification that might be quite useful for some applications in various fields, this point has remained very much unexplored till very recently. So it basically, this concept of parity time symmetry in quantum mechanics. Back in 1998, uh, Bender and Boecher uh, basically proposed this new idea that, uh, you know, unlike what we used to think before that, that uh, for, a, for, a, for a quantum mechanical system to have, uh, to be real, it has to have, uh, you know, the, the, it has to be Hermitian in order to represent eigenspectra that is real. It has to be um, all the all the potentials involved must be Hermitian. They showed that basically you can come up with a non-Hermitian type of uh, potentials that result in uh, entirely real spectra. And in this case, um, and in this case, um, what what basically takes for this system to be non-Hermitian means that it has to be um, uh, PT symmetric meaning that uh, if you apply operator P and T to this uh, potential, it becomes, the potential becomes, uh, it remains to what it used to be. So what happens is eventually that these systems, uh, when, when, a, when a Hamiltonian becomes PT symmetric, they also notice the very interesting property that it has, that uh, the spontaneous breaking of PT symmetry is becoming associated with the presence of an exceptional point. And this is, the importance of this work is that for the first time, people realize how they can actually generate exceptional points in a systematic way in a system. Um, however, the significance of this uh, discovery uh, remained unnoticed uh, for almost a decade until my former colleague uh, and collaborator, Dimitri Kisodolidis, started to 
actually explore some of the some of the ramifications of PT symmetry in optics. So this uh, and basically took some of the ideas that has been you know generated in the quantum um, field theory and brought brought them to optics. Now this 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 um, this uh, migration of idea has been motivated by the fact that the Schrodinger equation and paraxial wave approximation in, in their shape and in their form, they're isomorphic and they're basically very similar in shape with each other. And also what we have there in, um, in uh, Schrodinger equation as potential, uh, similar, if you look at the two equations, that, that's, that happens to be very similar to the, what we know as refractive index in optics. And since uh, we know, uh, again, that the potentials are very difficult to make them complex, uh, uh, as we know in nature, most of the potentials that we get are in fact real, so they, they cannot become PT symmetric, uh, meaning that the real part has to be a, an even function of a space and in the imaginary part must be an even odd function of a space. In optics, refractive index is, uh, it's pretty trivial to actually make the refractive index to be PT symmetric in the sense that uh, the real part of the refractive index is what we know as refractive index, for example, this is what we know, for example, for air is one and for water is 1.33 at optical frequencies. And the imaginary part of refractive index is what is known to us as gain and loss. So, um, so and this, uh, you know, when it is, for example, positive, it can be considered gain. And when it's negative, it can be considered loss. It's also, it's a convention. So it's all depend on how you write your equations. But effectively, we know that refractive index is, uh, is something that can be, uh, you know, designed to be PT symmetric. And using this concept, then they started to show a whole bunch of ideas. And let me now bring you to the system, bring you to a simple system that can actually, uh, using this concept of gain and loss, a, a, an exceptional point can be realized in uh, optics. So. In this uh, system, basically what I'm showing is that it's a, it's the two um, coupled resonators that one of them is subject to gain and the other one is subject to loss. Um, they are coupled with each other with the discoupling coefficient uh, kappa. And uh, okay, so this coupling coefficient kappa, and you can see, you can easily write the, the equations that are governing the system. Uh, it can uh, basically, we could say that the field in one of them, let's say in the one with the loss is uh, A and the field in the one with the gain is uh, B, uh, the electric field. So the change in the electric field would be related to the, to, the, to the gain and also to the coupling that comes from the other elements. So that explains this first equation. Now the second equation tells you what happens when you have, uh, what happens in the other resonator, in the other resonator. So this is where the two resonators are basically exchanging energy in time. And uh, when we solve these two equation, and you can see this is where basically the Hamiltonian comes, comes into the picture. The Hamiltonian relates dA dt and dB dt to uh, B and A. And what you get is basically uh, when you solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, you notice that at g over two kappa equal to one, the two eigenvalues become exactly equal to each other, meaning that in this case, they both become equal to zero. And the two eigenvectors are also becoming equal to each other. And both of them are one I, okay? Um, and basically this I is now showing there is a phase difference between them. Now, um, looking at the system um, in the parameter space, this parameter space for us now is G over two kappa or G over kappa, sometime, you know, that, that to, it depends on how you define it. So if um, in this case, you see that before, um, before G over kappa equal to one, we have um, we, the system responds as if there, we will get two eigenvalues, the two eigenvalues, both of them will have uh, uh, real components and their imaginary part is equal to zero. And as we increase this G over kappa and get to G over kappa equal to one, we see that the system starts to behave very differently, uh, especially at that point uh, and forward. Uh, and in this case, uh, the two eigen, the, the real part of the eigenvalues become equal to each other and goes to zero. And the imaginary part of the eigenvalues now start to bifurcate. And 
what, what is the significance of it is that be, before the PD symmetry breaking point or the exceptional point, which is just another word for, for saying this word, this, this point uh, representing this word, this point, um, the energy is distributed equally between the two resonators. So it's a, it's a very uh, intuitive uh, you know, effect. When you have two resonators, the energy goes back and forth between the two of them. And effectively, we expect that energy to normalize itself. But this is only true when the difference between gain and loss of these two resonators is linear. And as we said, as G over kappa, as, as G, the, the, the gain loss contrast uh, surpasses that of uh, kappa, the coupling between the elements. One of the, we will see two modes that they, they basically happen exactly at the same uh, frequency, but their imaginary part, which is basically their gain and loss, would be different. One of the two modes will be mostly in such a way that most of its energy is in one resonator, and the other mode appears as if most of the energy is in the, in, in the other resonator. So in this case, you see that one of them, because this is most of the loss, it will be very lossy, and the other mode will see a lot of gain and will be very gainy. And that basically says why the two um, eigenvalues have different imaginary component, that one of them is positive and the other one is negative. Now, with that uh, little introduction, the, when I, back in uh, 2014, when I started working in this uh, area, or 2013 perhaps, um, uh, when I started working in this area, there has been a lot of work that we're showing uh, such, such points indeed can be observed in various optical settings. And uh, it started from the work of uh, Roberto, uh, Sal uh, Greg Salamo, Roberto Morandotti, and Chris Udolidis, that they basically show two resonators, uh, two wa optical waveguides that are coupled to each other. And they showed that when they increase loss on one of the resonators, eventually the, 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 the transmission of the other waveguide actually increases. They also showed uh, exceptional points and the uh, ramifications of PD symmetry in fiber networks, in resonator systems, various groups like Rotter and Young's group. And uh, again, in 2014, we started to look at um, the, what, what would the, what, how we can use these exceptional points for, for designing various optical systems. And the first thing that we looked at was for lasers. And we looked at various types of lasers and how we can actually use this sharp transition at the exceptional point as an extra threshold in the system to, manage the number of modes that would lase in a, in a lasing system uh, that is PD symmetric. So let me just give you an idea. We started to look at the uh, ring resonators. Um, ring resonators have been used for a lot of application integrated photonics. Um, the question is, why don't we use them for lasers? And one of the reasons is the fact that they are, um, as lasers, they, 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 a lot of time for lasers using, used in, um, fiber optic communication or in lots of applications, we actually indeed, we want lasers that are single mode. However, these, these ring resonators, even a very small one, even if when the diameter is only uh, 10 or 15 micron, they start to actually show uh, multi-mode behavior over the mostly very broad gain bandwidth of uh, most semiconductors that goes up even over hundred nanometer. So in this case, Yes, we can have them single modded if we live, we are very, very close to the threshold, but as we increase the uh, pump power to go fairly above threshold, they start to show up all these modes that are, their quality factors are almost the same. They start to show up and the system very easily becomes uh, multi-modded. Now, uh, to tell you how we apply this idea of a, of a PT symmetric to this, uh, PT symmetry, uh, to this system and to make it single modded, let me first uh, say what happens if I have a coupled micro ring laser. In this case, I have two laser, two micro ring resonators that are basically active and they, they, they have a uh, gain. And uh, I couple them with each other. So they have a coupling uh, between them is kappa. Um, and what we observe is that, uh, of course, because it's like uh, two, uh, you bring two um, hydrogen atom next to each other, you expect level splitting. And this is the, this splitting of the resonances that you observe is basically the same effect. You see that each resonance that you had for a single ring, now it became doubled. So effectively you doubled your problems of uh, 
uh, laser because now you have even more modes in the system. And we know that this, uh, this basically the, the equation that governs this behavior is uh, for the eigenmodes modes is basically the one that you see um, here. Uh, here. And what it says basically is that uh, the eigen, if, if the, two of the, the two of them have exactly the same value of gain, gain here is shown by gamma um, A and gamma B for the resonator A and B. If they have the same amount of uh, gain, so you expect this to be equal to zero. And as a result of that, the, the eigenmodes will be split in the real frequency domain by a value that is basically equal to a square root of kappa squared, which is kappa. So basically the, the coupling will, will determine how much these two resonances will be apart from each other. Now, if we move to the PT symmetric arrangement, it's basically the very similar to what we have for a coupled system. But in, this time, instead of applying a gain to both resonators, we apply, we, we basically make one of the resonators lossy. And this is a very simple thing in active and three five semiconductors because as long as we don't we do not pump the structure, it remains lossy. So having a lossy system is very simple. Of course, having gain is the most uh, difficult thing to accomplish. So in this system now, uh, again looking back at the equations, we will see that based on the the, the value of gain loss uh, gain loss contrast, we may get to a situation where, for example, if the gain loss contrast is la large enough, we can get um, the, uh, and, and they are uh, equal to each other, this component becomes equal to zero. And what, what remains is this component, which is now twice because gamma one minus gamma two, one of them is being positive, the other one negative, it makes it twice the gamma. And that's what you see here, basically, the, the eigenvalues of the system or the frequency separations are now governed by this equation. And this is an interesting equation because as you can see, if your kappa or the gain, the coupling is larger or smaller than gamma, you will see two very different behaviors. If kappa is larger than gamma, you see that there would be a splitting. This, 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 uh, this quantity, this uh, expression becomes positive and you see, is splitting in the real frequency domain. But if gamma becomes, or the gain contrast between the gainy and lossy element becomes larger than kappa, you will notice that the, 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 this value becomes negative. And as a result of that, you see a splitting in the, in, the, um, in the imaginary frequency domain. An imaginary frequency domain is what we know as gain and loss. So the two, there would be two resonances that are happening at the very same uh, frequency, but uh, frequency, real frequency, but their their quality factors are very different. And one of them sees a lot of loss and lasers, and the other one sees a lot of, uh, sorry, one of them sees a lot of gain and lasers, and the other one sees a lot of loss and attenuates. So effectively, the systems becomes uh, sees one mode that is, uh, if it, if it happens to be for one of these reson one of these set of resonances, the PD symmetry breaks, you or you are above the exceptional point, you will notice that the resonances looks uh, like this. While the rest of the resonances where the gain loss contrast is not yet enough, you will see that the two resonance, you still get the two, the splitting of the resonances in the real frequency domain. And because they are, the mode is half in the gainy side and half in the lossy side, it effectively sees, um, you know, effective gain is going to be zero. So these modes are all, going to be very lossy and they would not lace. And the only mode that actually sees a lot of gain and can lace is the red one that happens uh, to be at, right at the, at the center of the, um, you know, where, where the original mode of a single ring used to be. With that, let me just uh, now show you the experimental results that we got. Do you have a question? Uh, there seems to be a question. I don't uh, see Frank, Frank has a question. No. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, how are you able to control which um, mode is it? So you can selectively choose a single mode that will reach the PT broken um, regime. So, so in, in that arrangement, it's the one that is closest to the height of the game. So it's the, the mode that sees the highest game because that's the one that the 
gain loss contrast is the highest for it. So that that that's how we choose. Does it make sense? Uh, okay. So. so in the experiment, this is what you get from a single ring. As you can see, this is uh, the back in 2014. We looked at all these three cases that I just showed you in the in the in the in the three previous slides. So for a single ring, as I said, we expect multi-mode operation. That's what you observe. You see that in this system, we get uh, four modes. Uh, for a double uh, system where we have uh, two ring resonators, both of them uh, are pumped. And as a result of that, both of them see gain. We see that the mode splitting happens. And when we cover one of the ring resonators, basically with the, from the pump, these are all optically pumped. And what you see here is the intensity, um, intensity profile um, you know, from the camera. And uh, so in, in the case of a single ring, you see that it's just one ring and it's the, this is the spectrum of the device. Um, in the case of uh, two rings, this is the spectrum. And uh, again, you see the splitting of each of the resonances. And in the case when we have a PT system, so there, in this case, we have another resonator here, but it hasn't been pumped. And uh, as a result of that, there is no power in it and it looks blackish. Uh, and you can see that the system actually returns to become single model. So these two are actually the very same structures. It's just that one of them, both of the rings are pumped, and in the other case, only one of the rings is pumped. Now, uh, to what is important, and actually as a, as a laser system, it's uh, the, the most interesting part, is that if we look at the power, the total power that is emitted from any of these systems, we see that the total power is equal in all three cases. The, you know, the total power per, you know, pump ring. So you can see that, for example, in the case where we have uh, a single ring, you have the total power per pump ring is going to be the same as what we see in a, in a, in a evenly pumped double ring system and in the PT symmetric system. So what it means is that even though I have this element here in a PT symmetric system that is actually lossy, however, because of the, because at, above the PT symmetric breaking point, the power distributed, the mode re reshape itself in such a way that there is very little overlap with the lossy element. Uh, there is not actually any uh, compromising, any any compromisation of the uh, of the of the overall uh, gain of the system, or or the what we know in laser terminology as uh, slope efficiency. Also, another in interesting and possibly more important aspect of this. Okay, so um, it's also important to look at the intensity in the desired mode. So here we have uh, four um, modes. So the overall intensity, if we look at now, compare one of these, uh, one of these uh, resonances with what we, the power that we get over here, you can see that the power that we get in one of the resonances is almost one fourth of what we get in a PT symmetric uh, double ring system. So effectively what a PT symmetric uh, laser does is that it gets all the energy that was going before into four modes and push all of them to come coherently out of one mode of the resonator only. So that's that's really the importance of this type of laser. It's a, it's a very nice way of making the structure single mode without a lot of effort. So we use this kind uh, before I go further. It's now becoming a very disorganized talk. And I'm very sorry about that. Okay, so before I go further, I mean, back in uh, 2014 or 15, I asked my student to go to the lab and make a video out of it because it's, uh, as I said, the effect is very visible when you look at it uh, in real time. So these are basically two videos that are taken almost at the same, you know, at the same time. In one of them, what we do is, so in the experiment, what we do, we, we pump the two rings first together at the same rate, and then we bring a knife edge and cover uh, the pump, you know, the, the cover the pump from one of the uh, ring resonators. So we, that's how the system behaves. And this is how, what happens to the, to the resonances or to the spectrum. So what you saw is that as we basically got closer and closer to, you know, we covered the, one of the rings and got to, to the exceptional point, the system became nicely single modded. Um, Now, 
We also use the, you know, these exceptional points in many other geometries and the PD symmetry is a very nice and uh, powerful technique for generating exceptional points. But today we know that there are many other ways to generate them. And uh, we use some of these other concepts also to, to make uh, lasers. Um, one of them is dark state laser where we have two ring resonators with different uh, radii. And we basically put, open up the system because uh, exceptional points happen in open system or non-conservative system. So we open them uh, effectively by putting a waveguide in between the two resonators. Another idea was to use um, PT symmetric uh, system for making uh, spatially multi-mode or transversely multi-mode ring resonator single mode. Oh, and it, this idea can be applied to many other type of resonators, of course. Uh, we, we applied it to ring resonators. Um, so you can basically now make a very broad area laser by just uh, uh, filtering out all the higher order spatial modes of the structure uh, using this uh, threshold that the exceptional point provides for various modes of the, of the resonator. Um, another uh, area where we use this uh, type of uh, non-hermeticity to push uh, together with some other concepts was the supersymmetric laser array that we published um, two years ago in science. And this is basically where we have two sets of uh, waveguide arrays, uh, laser waveguide array, where we design them in such a way that uh, all the modes, but the fundamental mode will be paired with each other. And then we apply loss to one of the one set of resonators and gain to another one. And this way we are pushing the, um, the fundamental mode of the main array to actually uh, lays as the only mode of the, uh, of the array. So this is a technique to make laser array single mode. And finally, we use the exceptional points that appear because of this uh, very interesting uh, geometry that now I'm using it all the time. Basically, we put an S-band inside the resonator. We can show that the introduction this S -band of this S-band and various variation of it can make a, um, can break the rotational symmetry of the structure, imposes a new type of exceptional point that is quite broadband. We use this concept to make a tunable orbital angular momentum laser. The way that it works is basically we have um, using the S band and the and and the exceptional point in this case removes one of the counter propagating modes of the structure and makes the you know we know that the whispering gallery modes have a lot can have very large uh, values of orbital angular momentum. This basically breaks the degeneracy of the modes and makes. Uh, makes one of the one of the whispering gallery modes to lays, and as a result of that, it emits the uh, high orbital angular momentum. Now, a lot of times, this very high orbital angular momentum is actually not something that we are interested in. We are interested in much lower orbital angular momentum, uh, because as you know, the higher orbital, higher orbital angular momentum, they can actually become very sensitive. So uh, in that respect, what we can do is we can put this uh, grading, uh, around the structure and lower the, the, the order of orbital angular momentum. And uh, with then with temperature tuning, we can actually have a tunable orbital angular momentum basis. Again, this has been published a couple of years. So with that, let me now start the second uh, topic that I would like to talk about. And that's how we use up exceptional points as in sensors. So we know, as a matter of fact, that optical resonators are used for sensors, and uh, they're actually quite a powerful type of sensors. Uh, there has been used; they have been used for sensing applications for quite a long time. There has been a more recent, uh, uh, well, recent is a, it's a very um, vague word, but uh, there has been some interest, uh, more interest in this topic, especially after the, all these very high Q. Um, integrated uh, structures showed up, like microtoroidal and microring resonators, where they can actually be nicely done and cheap, uh, nicely used and cheap for, and they have very high uh, quality factors and they can actually be used for uh, sensing applications. Now, the use of optical resonators for sensors is very, conceptually, it's very simple. What we, what we do in various forms and despite many, many different type of uh, resonators that we have and many different uh, shapes and, and systems, 
Uh, the, the, con the concept behind it is they are basically refractive index change sensors in the sense that we bring some target next to a resonator, it changes effectively the environment that, this, uh, that the resonator is made of, and that changes the resonance frequency of the sensor, uh, the, the, this is structure. Now we can either probe it or like in some application, we can actually have it uh, active and it lasers at the various frequencies. And based on the change in the, uh, in the frequency or wavelength, we can actually say, what was it? What, what perhaps it was this material that we brought it to, uh, to, to the vicinity of this uh, resonator and that's why we see these changes. But what is fundamental and possibly most important aspect to this uh, talk uh, is the fact that this, this change of the frequency or wavelength uh, is linearly proportional to the perturbation that we are bringing to the system. So all these various type of uh, sensors that you see, optical sensors that you see, their differences is in you know, the effectiveness of the way that you bring the, the, the target to the, to the vicinity of the resonator and not in the fact that the, the resonator fundamentally becomes more sensitive. And you can also see that the, this relationship, the fact that the, the fact that, uh, you know, in optics people know D lambda over Dn is equal to lambda over N. So what it means is that even, even that change in the frequency or lambda, the wavelength is in fact only proportional to the change in the delta N, the, the, the refractive index. It's not even dependent on the quality factor. The fact that we have quality, very high quality factor is just gives us better detection limit, not better, better sensitivity or better, better uh, you know, device in the, in the sense that it has a bit higher sensitivity. So the question is, can we actually increase the sensitivity fundamentally? And it happens that in fact, non-hermitian systems that are biased at exceptional points are fundamentally more sensitive than hermitian systems, no matter what you do. So, and this comes uh, again, it's a mathematical concept. It, you basically, we know perturbation analysis, it can be applied to emission systems. So the first two lines are the generically, we say, what happens if we have a system that is this one and we are perturbing it with a perturbation epsilon. And you can see in a Hermitian system, and this is known in uh, every, every quantum mechanics uh, book, uh, when they discuss the, the, the perturbation, that basically the perturbation is expected to follow this type of equation. So the eigenfrequencies are expected to be following this type of equation. And you can see that the best response that the Hermitian system can give you, since epsilon is very small, we expect that epsilon is squared to be even smaller. So to the first degree, the response of the system would be proportional, linearly proportional to the perturbation that we applied. And all these other terms are actually negligible. Now in a non-hermitian system at an exceptional point, and I'm now saying in the order of, of order N, and I will define in a minute what is the order of the N, we can actually, you can, you, you can mathematically, if we want to apply the perturbation, we have to use this series. And what it says is that the, the best response of the system, because again, these this are the, the, you know, the secondary effects, so they can be ignored. So the best response of the system is proportional that the, 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 the change in the eigenvalue is proportional to the square root of, or for example, nth root of uh, perturbation. And because perturbation is usually a very small effect, the nth root we expect that to be uh, magnified. So that's why, uh, you know, exceptional points uh, generate the systems, non-hermitian systems that are, that are biased at exceptional point, they have higher sensitivity. And uh, so this is, uh, and by uh, exceptional point of order n, what we mean is that when n, you know, when we have a system with n degrees of freedom and n eigenvalues collapse and become equal and n eigenvectors collapse on each other, that would be a system with, uh, with, that has an exceptional point of order n. And this is also, if you think about the concept of uh, sensitivity, it's also, uh, it becomes very clear if you think about it as, you know, at the exceptional point, the system that used to have two dimension or n dimension, so at that particular point, it has only uh, one dimension. Now, if I perturb the system, I go back, it's a very dramatic effect in the sense that it goes, the system all of a sudden from one dimension goes back to become n-dimensional again. And as a result of that, we see this sort of magnified uh, 
uh, effect of uh, and, and higher sensitivity. So in, in essence, how we are generating this uh, exceptional points of higher order, it's for exceptional point of second order, it's what you saw, we have two, for example, resonators, one of them with gain and the other one with loss, that are coupled with the coupling of kappa. Um, we can show that this system, we are actually showed in uh, one of the previous slides, that this system supports a, an exceptional point when the gain loss contrast and kappa, kappa become uh, comparable. Now, in, for example, in a tree system like this, where we have three resonators, so the system has three degrees of freedom, we expect three modes, um, we can reach an exceptional point of order three by designing the system to have this particular type of coupling versus gain loss contrast uh, distribution. And um, for an exceptional point of a uh, higher order, like for example, order four, you can actually generate it by, uh, again, there, there is, in fact, there is, a, there is a recipe as how to generate these chains and other types of chain, you know, 2D chain, 1D chain, of uh, higher that that uh, represent higher order exceptional points, and this is the response that we expect. The resonance shift that we get as a normalized uh, as we are applying normalized perturbation, and you can see that this is what you get from a single cavity. And as you go to higher and higher order exceptional points, you see that the response of the system appears to to be uh, you know uh, square root dependent and so on and so forth, and or n root um, dependence and uh, what is important is really when you get very small perturbation, you can see that the response of the system becomes really, really much more uh, stronger than what you expect from a, uh, from a standard Hermitian system. And uh, again, this is, uh, I give always this example, I know it's trivial, but let's say you have a perturbation of the order of 10 to the power minus six. If you have a second order exceptional point, the system will behave, the, the resonance of the system will shift as if you brought a target with a, with a refractive index of 10 to the power of minus three. So you can see immediately you got uh, a thousand times improvement in the, in the response of the system. Now, if you have a perturbation, if you have an exceptional point of order three, that would become, you know, uh, you know as you brought 10 to the power of minus six, uh, that would be as if you brought something 10,000 times larger to the vicinity of the structure as if you're, the, the target that you wanted to detect has much higher refractive index than what it actually indeed had. So the, the, the system response as if it, was, it, it, it has been perturbed by much bigger uh, or larger um, effect. So in order to show this effect, we back in 2017, we designed these systems that they, we applied the perturbation through thermo-optic coefficient and for that, we equipped each of the resonator uh, with an extra, you know, microheater, uh, which we applied electricity and, and generated heat locally to um, observe this effect. So we have three resonators and we pump one of them. We leave one of them, um, you know, with less pump and the other one, with, uh, we just leave it unpumped. This is uh, what you see for the three resonators. Uh, the way that it looked like in some of the fabrication steps. This is the, these are the heaters from the back of the sample. And this is how we wired them to the experiment. And this is uh, what we observed in the experiments when we applied this term optical, the, the, this perturbation through term optical efficient. And you can see that uh, in the uh, case of a binary system where we have two resonators and we get a second order exceptional point, the response of the system follows a square root behavior. And also we can also verify it perhaps a little bit better by looking at the uh, slope in the log-log uh, curve. And you can see that in this case, the slope is again uh, one half. Um, we also, you know, quantitatively, the amount, the, the increase, uh, the, the enhancement in the sensitivity, we can measure it comparing a single ring to, a, to, a, to, to one of these, uh, you know, uh, systems that are biased at an exceptional point. And in this case, you can see that the sensitivity is enhanced to order of 14 and 15. And this is uh, this is uh, the limitation of our system in the sense that, you know, how much we can go close to the exceptional point. In a, a third order, except for a third order exceptional point, this is where we have three resonators. And very interestingly, actually, I always show this because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very clear indication that things are working. Uh, 
So remember that we are pumping one of them strongly and the other one almost none. Um, and then in the center, we pump it half, you know, like, like uh, in, a, in a lesser degree to keep the system at transparency or neutral. And remember, all of this gain and loss and neutrality are, are, depend, are, are uh, relative. So we can, in, it doesn't matter if we have absolute gain and loss or just uh, a contrast between two gain or a contrast between two loss. Uh, nevertheless, what is interesting about this uh, plot is that at the exceptional point, when we look at the you know, emission from the system, this is what you see. Actually, the element, the neutral element, appears to be uh, shining the most amount of light. And be, that's because at the exceptional point, the eigenmode of interest is one square root of two and one. So the intensity is expected to be uh, higher in the central element here. Yeah. Um, this is how the system evolves. So what you see at the very beginning of this curve is when we are at the exceptional point. And as we are increasing again uh, through the thermooptic coefficient, we are applying the perturbation. The system basically moves away from, uh, from the exceptional point and the three resonances start to shift away from each other. And this, this, this you know, splitting of the resonances that we at the end of the day we measure, and from that we deduce how much was the perturbation that we applied. So the next thing that we did, we said that how we can use this sort of enhanced um, sensitivity um, in, in, a, in an actual application. One of the things that came to our mind was uh, ring laser gyroscopes. The reason that we chose ring laser gyroscopes is because already they are lasers, because a lot of time people say, oh, yes, you get enhanced sensitivity, but we have very high detection limit in, a, in resonators with quality factors of one billion. So yeah, you get better sensitivity, but we can see better because we have better detection limit. Uh, and you know it's much easier. You are basically the, practically these systems require a, a gain loss contrast. That is another difficulty that you apply to the system. So for that reason, we looked at ring laser gyroscopes because they were already applying gain to the system. So these are these are basically what we have here. Is that these are the devices that uh, use for rotation sensing, and they work based on Sanyak effect. Uh, what it is basically, there would be a Sanyak shift that is rotation, the direction of the rotation dependence. So the light that travels, so if the, if the resonator is in a rotating frame, the light that travels in one direction would see a longer path and the light that travels in the, in other, in the other direction sees a low, shorter path. And as a result of that, there would be a, there would be a phase difference between these two, um, uh, these two beams. And of course, in a laser setting, the phase difference just you can face once you are introduced gain that that phase difference would be translated to a splitting in the in the resonances. So, and that's what basically they use they they use this splitting of the resonances to detect how much was the rotation the gyration speed of the frame of reference. So, can we use this enhanced sensitivity for ring laser gyroscope? And back again, 2017, we showed that this is uh, indeed a at least a plausible, very plausible scenario. We, it's a very simple system. We have one gain, one, one, one rings with gain, the other one with loss, and we are uh, biasing it at, a, at an exceptional point and put it in a, uh, in a, in a system for a frame of reference that, uh, that, that rotates. And um, we can actually look at what is the sensitivity of the PD symmetric gyroscope and what kind of result we expect to get from this system. Let's say, you have in a single ring laser gyroscope, you expect that um, the frequency splitting that you see uh, because of the rotation would be dependent, linearly dependent to omega, which is the gyration speed, as well as the radius of the ring and the wavelength. So if your ring resonator is only 10 micron, you expect that for one degree of uh, rotation per hour, the resonance splitting would be in the order of 1.2 millihertz, which observing it is becoming very, very difficult. That's why we don't have ring resonators, especially uh, semiconductor based ring laser gyroscopes. Now, if we now move to PD symmetric structure and we, we the same structure with a, with a reasonable coupling that we know it's possible to get, uh, that that frequency splitting that you know in a for one degree of per hour rotation speed would be in the order of fifty kilohertz. That is more reasonable and more you know uh, approachable. Of course, the one option is to increase the ring radius, and that would uh, also further increase the separation of the two resonances and make this device more reasonable. 
Now we can actually show that in PV symmetric uh, coupled ring system, um, it's possible because remember, the lower you go in the in the uh, rotation speed, the, the smaller the perturbation, the system behaves better. So as a result of that, it's a square root behavior. So as a result of that, we can actually show that it's in, in, on paper, it's possible to get 10 to the power of seven time sensitivity enhancement. So, and we did some calculation to show what is the maximum sensitivity enhancement. And that's where something very interesting happened. We actually can show that the maximum sensitivity enhancement is uh, no longer uh, dependent on the, on the size of the resonator. And the maximum sensitivity enhancement, that ratio that you get from uh, when comparing the standard ring with the, with the PT symmetric ring that is biased at the exceptional point, it only depends on a bunch of constants multiplied by omega, which is uh, a square root of omega that is the gyration speed. Um, so with that, we basically said uh, it's good now to experimentally show this effect. And uh, for the experimental um, you know, demonstration, what we chose to do, we basically went to a standard, we bought this uh, standard ring laser gyroscope, helium neon based ring laser gyroscope. It's an educational kit. And we re retrofitted it to, uh, MU, to, to artificially generate an exceptional point in the system and then use that, uh, that exceptional point for sensitivity enhancement. In order to do that, we basically place, uh, this is the ring laser, the standard ring laser gyroscope. And what we, uh, as you can see, there is the CW and CCW that go through the cavity. And because of etalon, they, um, you can actually choose only one frequency. In the PT symmetric or EP based helium neon ring laser gyroscope, what we, the way that we generate, we, we, we basically uh, apply different amount of loss to the CW and CCW mode. And we do it through the introduction of a Faraday rotator and a half wave plate. So these two are basically, uh, you know, you know, applying different amount of uh, loss because the way that the light travels and and uh, the fact that the booster windows are actually polarization polarizers effectively in the system. So what we see is that the light that travels in one direction because of the Friday rotation um, would see a different amount of and the polarizer would see a different loss than the light that travels in the opposite direction. And we use this etalon to basically um couple these two resonances to each other so we remember in a pt symmetric system we need gain loss contrast or some you know in this case gain contrast because helium neon tube is providing gain and then we have very small amount of uh, loss uh, difference between the mode that the, the clockwise and counterclockwise mode and then we have the coupling that is in this case provided by uh, the ethyl and these are some of the experimental results that we got. So interestingly, we can see that the standard helium neon ring laser, gy ring laser gyroscope, uh, th this is the yellow line over here. And um, in the log log scale, you can show that the slope of uh, this line is one and the slope of these lines, which are the, the, the various, uh, exceptional point uh, at various kappa levels, uh, you can see that the, the, the systems behave uh, as expected with the square root of, uh, uh, to the square root of the gyration speed or rotation rate. And uh, we can even show that uh, unlike what we see in the standard uh, ring laser gyroscopes that below a certain degree because the clockwise and counterclockwise are mixed to each other to whatever scattering that you have in the system, it's no longer, actually, these devices no longer show, you can, can be used below a degree that is rotation rate that is known as lock-in um, rate. You can no longer see anything. And in the PD symmetric system, we can even access that regime. So that's very impressive. And here you can see how much improvement of the, of the sensitivity we observe in our systems. Parallel to our work, there were also, um, you know, uh, the group of Kerry Vahala from uh, Caltech, also they did this similar experiments using um, um, using uh, simulated uh, SPS processes. And uh, they, they also observed similar uh, sensitivity enhancement. 
Um, albeit these two systems are, are different in some respects in the sense that their game is almost, you know, uh, our game is a triple game, their game is different and, and because of the SPS game is very different in response than, um, than the game that we get in semiconductors or helium in any stretch. Okay, so I'm gonna go because I think I talked about um, non-hermeticity a lot. I, and we have, there are very interesting properties about non-hermitian system. And I wanted to talk about one other effect. Um, the, and that would be what happens in the, when, to the, when we have a 2D parameter space. Uh, this, is a, this is a less studied effect associated with the uh, non-emission non degeneracies. And it, the, the interesting part here is that we are, when we are in a, a non-emission system, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Riemann sheets representing the eigenvalue, uh, uh, eigenvalue um, uh, Riemann sheets, basically uh, the eigenvalues, they are basically not, uh, not very simple. They are very complex in shape. And as a result of that, you can actually show that the adiabatic theorem uh, applies very differently to these systems. Um, and uh, it, has, it has very interesting and less explored um, um, geometrical uh, and topological behaviors. But uh, as I said, I don't think that I can do that if I want to talk a little bit about topology and some of our very recent results that I'm excited about. So uh, in the last 10 minutes, uh, maybe I, I try to make it even shorter. I would like to talk about the photonic emulation of condensed matter. And we know that photonic systems has been, um, you know, routinely now used for emulating uh, um, condensed matter systems. And of course, a lot of other systems as well, but condensed matter specific, especially. And there is a nice correspondence between these two systems. I think I showed it uh, the isomorphism between Schrodinger equation and paraxial wave approximation. And you can also say that in, uh, you can design these arrays such that, uh, so the arrays of the photonic array to resemble what we see in the condensed matter, like for example, graphene or other type of uh, materials. Uh, and what, what, what basically allows us to do this, uh, go from one domain to another one, is the fact that uh, resonators or waveguides are effectively can be used as, uh, you know, what atoms or potential waves are actually representing. Uh, we have coupling in photonic systems with, between resonators or waveguides. In uh, atomic system, we have interatomic electron tunneling. Uh, light transport is what we expect from electron motion in, in, the, in the condensed matter systems. Um, tight bonding Hamiltonian is the interaction matrices that we get in, the, in, in, the, in, in these uh, optical systems. And of course, Schrodinger equation and wave equations, as we saw, they are very similar to each other. Now, the ultimate testament of, you know, you can use, use, use photonic for emulating condensed matter is perhaps the field of topological photonics that came as basically emulating various topological uh, insulator systems in optics and see and use some of the benefits that uh, topological insulators providing uh, for you know transport of light. And what is important is the fact that it was not even it was shortly after the first demonstration of the first topological insulator uh, materials that topological insulator optical uh, systems uh, lattices showed up. Uh, for example, uh, quantum spin Hall effect, uh, the first demonstration was in 2013, but the, the first uh, conceptual idea came in 2011, while uh, the first topological insulator laser uh, material has been shown in 2007 and eight. Um, and uh, not only that, there are topological insulator models that have not been realized in, um, in condensed matter, and we can already show them in uh, optics, and that's really amazing. Like, for example, this quantum Hall effect has been first shown in optics. Uh, no, quantum Hall effects actually has been has been around, but uh, the fluke topological insulators has been shown first in optics, and so far hasn't been even shown in condensed matter, and uh, uh, so on, so so on and so forth. So, what is common between all these initial works and uh, topological photonics is that they are based on passive systems. So effectively, they have been designed, the coupling between the elements and so on to emulate the, 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 the presence of a magnetic field. And they are like impassive in the sense that you have to probe this 
structures exactly like what we do in condensed matter, like you send the current through the system and see what happens to it. Um, in, in this case, we send the light in, into one of these structures and look at the evolution of light and how it actually go around and how it transfers in the, inside the lattice and the light that gets out of the system to actually realize what is happening inside the system, to probe the system, to, to observe their behavior. Now, optics is much richer in some levels uh, than uh, condensed matter in the sense that in optics, we don't have, we have, we can have passive systems, but we can also access gain and nonlinearity. And these things, can, they can actually provide a lot of uh, new possibilities to, um, to, um, to, to know to the systems that exist in the condensed matter. So in that sense, a few years back, we looked at what happens if we actually make the uh, topological insulators out of materials that they have gained. And the first impression was that, okay, we are gonna get gain and instead of probing the system, we can actually look at the, look at the emission spectrum and realize what is what, how the underlying topology will affect the emission. Uh, behavior of the system and how light actually will be affected, how, how light interaction with matter will be affected in the presence of this topological, um, um, you know, um, effectively synthetic magnetic fields. And um, that has actually, it has been very rewarding. Instead, as I said, the, the very uh, first or the benefit is the fact that we do not need to actually probe the system. We do not need to send some light in and observe what is happening. We just build the system and pump it, and that would be start lasing, and then we can see all the all the effects. Uh, but in the in the, in that way, we also observe something interesting: is that the fact that we we've made the first topological insulator lasers, and they happen to have very interesting properties because of this topological edge mode. We were able to show that they have higher slope efficiency, both theoretically and experimentally. They can be single moded because, and this single modeness is not only transverse, but also you can, even, even if you have a very large resonator system, you can still design the topological band gap to actually limit the number of longitudinal mode in materials that they have very high gain bandwidth. So with, with that, we can actually make lasers that are both spatially and transversely single moded laser arrays. They are robust to perturbation and defects, and uh, there are many works on that area. So our group, uh, in collaboration with Moto Segev and Chris Dolidis, uh, we showed one of the first uh, lasers based on quantum spin hall effect. There were other works, uh, like uh, the work from um, Bahari, that the, he showed um, um, lasers on um, magneto-optic materials and uh, with, covered with uh, three five semiconductors. And these are basically based on quantum spin hall effect. More recently, there has been uh, a paper that uh, they realized electrically pumped topological insulator laser based on what is known as valley hall effect. Uh, it's another topological uh, type of insulators. Um, and these, these lasers are working at 10 Kelvin. Again, uh, in uh, our paper just got accepted. We also showed electrically pumped topological insulator lasers at room temperature and at telecom wavelength. Uh, again, based on quantum spin hall effect. So with all of that, uh, this brings me to the next point. So, but the use of gain is not only to, you know, all of these systems are basically topological in their passive representation. And then we are applying gain to just make that topological edge mode start to lace. But gain can in, in, introduce something even more, um, more interesting. And that's the fact that we, are, we have seen, uh, you know, a passive system. We know that, for example, in a passive system, if you have two resonators that are coupled to each other, the coupling from resonator one to two is exactly equal to the coupling from resonator two to one. And this is known, sometimes people call it um, because it's a, they are basically um, reciprocal. Um, in, when you have an active system, you're no longer bound by this uh, effect. You don't no longer need to have, uh, you know, the coupling from one element to another one would be similar to the to what you get from uh, two to one. And in in general, the coupling can be designed to be even complex and uh, non-symmetric. And to show you one of the structures that we designed to show this effect is is this structure down here, where we have two resonators. 
And each of, in each of them, we put one of those S-bends to make sure that they are becoming unidirectional. Then we couple them through as two directional couplers and uh, basically a piece of a waveguide or a couple of pieces of waveguides uh, we have. So, and by designing, by changing the ratio of this, uh, you know, the, the directional coupler and power division ratio, or by changing the uh, length of the link, we can actually get various type of interaction dynamics. We can get various type of coupling. We can have the couplings that are Hermitian, meaning that if they are real, they are equal to each other. And if they are imaginary, they are basically uh, related to each other through this relationship. We can also get non-Hermitian coupling, uh, which is basically means that kappa one to two is not equal to the kappa two to one conjugate. While they, you know, the intensities are the, the magnitude of the kappas are e equal. We can even get, in general, a very generic case where we have uh, couplings are totally different from each other, both in magnitude and in, uh, you know, imaginary part. So we um, we can in, experimentally we can show all these effect, all these uh, regimes, and some of it I think I have it here. You can see that we designed these uh, two resonators that are coupled to each other to the two 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 links, two uh, directional couplers and this link structure. And by choosing the length of the link here, we can actually make the coupling to become real, to become imaginary and Hermitian and then going to real. And in every case, we are actually examining interferometrically the output of the rings to show that what we are, we are saying is in fact what's happening. So, and we can show that, for example, if the coupling is real and, um, and has this relationship, we have we we can expect to have uh, um, the light coming from one of the resonators. This device is single modded, and when the coupling is a Hermitian and uh, like this but complex, we can expect the light to come uh, from both uh, structures, and it's uh, it's multi. It, it's basically in this case because we have two resonators, it has two uh, frequencies. So. We used also this concept to tackle one of the perhaps most uh, uh, interesting and most uh, unrealized uh, uh, lattices in, in uh, optics. So we looked at the uh, original Haldane lattice that was uh, proposed by Haldane in 1988. And uh, a lot of people believe that it led to the, um, basically to the discovery of all these topological insulator materials. And um, um, and Haldane has been uh, has has got the Nobel Prize in uh, 2016 for for this structure. Um, so basically, what the Haldane lattice what it requires is that it it uh, composed of two. It's a honeycomb lattice, and it composed of two types of atoms. Here, for the two types of atoms, we put two types of resonators, and they are detuned from each other. And then we also have um, we also have uh, this very strange coupling where we have uh, not only next ne nearest neighboring coupling but also we have next nearest neighbor coupling where uh, from one element of the same type to the another element of the same type in one direction the coupling is it two and in the opposite direction is minus it two and given basically we we built this lattice and you can see uh, the geometry is pretty complicated, um, but this is a unit cell. Uh, this, this one here is a unit cell of this structure. And we can actually observe that this system has a churn number and it shows that the light, uh, you know, um, the preferentially direct, uh, travels around the uh, edge of the lattice in, in one direction. And of course, you can even use it to make a laser and to show it the laser properties as well. Now this, uh, ability to engineer the, the the interaction dynamics brings a lot of new possibilities. We are really at this point we are just exploring, um, and every day something very interesting happens. I put some of the possible applications that might be of interest to some people. Um, this is we can do near field beam steering. We, are, we can do far field beam, beam steering. We can generate overtime momentum. Uh, as I said, it's a very rich uh, area that a lot of new things that 
people never thought that it's possible to be done because before this, nobody thought that we can design the structures to have this non-symmetric and complex coupling. Now, if we can do it, what else we can do is something that we are still exploring. And with that, let me thank you. And I'm really sorry for overusing my time. Um, and uh, the work, of course, has been would not be possible if uh, there was not a generous support from uh, various agencies uh, over the years. And I would like to very much thank you for your patience and for uh, staying with me so far. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. So many cool results. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please, uh, uh, this is the time. Uh, please uh, uh, type them in Q&A or uh, I think Aki can let you speak then. Okay, maybe uh, just to begin with uh, Mercedes. So you mentioned about uh, the sensing, right? So in the case of sensing, let's say you have this uh, nth square root dependence for the perturbation. Now, let's say the, the stimulus, that is the, the thing that we want to sense is really small. We are almost close to the noise flow. How will it work then? So the noise will also add perturbation, which will also get the same gain, right? What I didn't talk about is the fact yeah. that what happens at the exception, what happens to quantum noise at the exception? Exactly, yeah. And there is, okay, so it's actually a matter of uh, study still. And there are, there are several results that basically there were even um, some work by um, Mahala's group that they showed that uh, at the exceptional point, the noise, the quantum noise uh, also increases at the same speed and the same rate as the sensitivity. However, in the, there are other works and theoretical works, and this is our observation as well. And that's why I said the gain system mm. is really different and makes a difference there. Mm. Uh, in, so in our system, we do not see that. And that's just because of the way that the gain saturates. So, uh, okay. and there has been a lot of studies. So some people, uh, some people claim that it has to be infinitely increased. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people, they say that it has to be same rate. Some people, they say that it's a lower rate based on the gain system under study. Okay. So uh, that's a very interesting and good question. Um, as I said, okay. there are yeah. many different uh, aspects. I think this should also tie to thermodynamics eventually, how much uh, energy you're putting in, how much information you can get out of the system, right? So. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a question by Benas. Uh, Benas, do you want to speak? Yes. Hi, Professor Fajabifan. Thanks for the very interesting talk. My question was from the first part of the talk on the PT symmetric project, of like how the pumping of single rings or evenly pumping of the double ring was done experimentally to make sure the resi like residuals of the pumping was not hitting any of the unwanted areas. So what we built is a basically, um, it's like a confocal microscope. So we can actually look at the sample. We, and in a camera, we can see the pumping and the sample by both of them. And then we bring the, um, the so there is a, there is a um, knife edge in an image plane, in a, in a like, let's say an object plane. And we are basically in the direction of the pumping and we bring it and the image of this shadow, we get it on the sample and we, we have control over all of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward for us to do. Uh, there's uh, one more question. And yes. what I didn't show just because I, I, I think it's just repetitive, but uh, eventually we did also electrically pump the uh, PT lasers. And there we have, uh, it's none of that problems exist. We actually pump it electrically and you can apply only pump to one sample or the other laser, so. Thank you. Chiai, uh, uh, you have a question on wireless communication, yes. So I'm, I come from a different background from wireless communication. Uh, I'm interested in the last slide you showed about the beam steering. Can you comment on how it can be used in wireless communication? Thank you. Wireless uh, communication, beam steering. Beam steering these days are actually people in optics are interested because of LIDAR and the, the you know, this self, um, 
driverless cars and so on, that they basically they want to observe all the objects and they want to use light and they want to send light in various directions. The beam steering system that we have is very similar to what you get from a phase array, but instead of so in an, if, if you want to do phase array in optics, you have to bring light with a waveguide and then divide this you know light into various uh, um, various outputs and put various phases on each element. So for example, you put uh, phase pi over four, two pi over four, three pi over four, four pi over four, and you get the particular amount of uh, angle uh, different ang angle shift. Now in the uh, angle rotation now for for the in the far field. Um, so in our system, it's not like that. It's we actually have a laser system. It's it's by itself is a laser, and it generates. You apply a particular amount of phase, and the phase is the same in all the elements. And for that particular phase, you get a um, you get a rotation, or uh, you know, in the far field, you the the beam that is coming out of this laser uh, array. Is like um, it has it has exactly the same properties as what we expect from a standard phase array. Uh, the the first element has a has a phase of pi over four, two pi over four, three pi over four as you go consecutively higher. So this is uh, the way that uh, we generate this uh, this type of. Uh, Should I it's, it's, expect yeah. the same speed uh, of steering? The speed and everything is the same. The only simplification is that. We are applying the same phase everywhere, and it's already a laser, so it's not that problem doesn't exist. So this the speed okay. Is, the, okay, the speed is uh, is uh, decided by the how fast you can actually modulate the phase. It's nothing to do with the rest of the system. You understand? Yeah. Okay. So this technology can be applied to all the laser systems. So uh, I mean, I, I'm interested in the band that you can apply. In the what band? So yeah, the one frequency. that we have right now, yeah. In principle, every any type of laser. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, the one that we are designing is at fifteen feet. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, please uh, let us know. If not, I think we don't want to extend this talk uh, too long. Instead, we'll. Uh, thank Masude and then Masude we are talking uh, meeting on a separate zoom link uh, with okay. our lab members so we can continue this discussion there. Thank, thank you. you all uh, for joining us and uh, we hope you will you will attend the next one we'll have later in March. Thank you. <laughs>